Hey there, Nick Jantakis here. In this video, we're gonna go over how to create an IP address allow list using Python in three different ways. And these different ways are gonna have various different trade-offs between complexity, how long it takes to run, various features, et cetera, et cetera. So throughout this video, we are gonna go over the logic for creating that whitelist. We're also gonna go over how to create an exempt list to that whitelist, working with CIDR blocks, as well as benchmarking all the solutions to ultimately pick one solution in the end. Now, like a lot of my videos, uh, we're gonna go over the why, basically understanding the problem before we get to the solution. And by the way, this blog post is right now, it's being hosted on localhost, but by the time that you watch this video, it will be on my main blog. I'll leave a link to this one in the description. Also, if you don't care about understanding the problem or you know how I arrived at the final solution, then feel free to use a timestamp to jump straight to the code in the benchmarks. There's also a link here too in the blog post if you want to go straight down to the code first. But uh, yeah, let's start off here with the problem first. Now, this post, by the way, is going to be, in this video, I should say, is going to be a mixture of technical details, like figuring out how to maximize business value based on your current problems, and also how asking a question can basically shape an entire feature. So let's start with like understanding the problem first. So recently for some client work, I was moving a cron job into Kubernetes, and it called the services API that uses an IP address allow list for an extra layer of security to prevent unwanted callers. So basically, when you call the service, uh, you provide an authentication token in a header to do basic authentication. But in addition to that, the application has some checks and bounds there to make sure that your IP address is in an allow list. So before it was in Kubernetes, uh, all I did there, well, all the crown job did there was it just curled the external domain of the service and that was flowing through the public internet. So basically it was sending a curl request to, you know, example.com slash API slash hello, right? It doesn't really matter what the endpoint is. And this application stored a comma separated list of IPs in a database which acted as the allow list. So on every single request, uh, it would get the request IP, do a database lookup, split the IPs on a comma, loop over each one, and then check to see if an exact IP was found or matched. So it was originally created to handle comparing exactly one IP address to another, since there was only a couple of callers from a few known static IPs. So the current solution pre-Kubernetes, it was not a problem at all. Now, I wasn't around when that code was written. Uh, the solution worked, and honestly, it's a, a very successful company in the grand scheme of things. I can't get into details for NDA reasons, but yeah, or NDA reasons, uh, but it is a successful company, let's just say that. Um, now, I know this could be solved at many different layers too, right? For example, you can do this at the firewall level, like uh, if you're using AWS, there's the WAF, or you can do this on Nginx, basically the web server level, level, or you can do it at the application level, which is what we're doing here. Now, they went for the app layer here so that admins can easily adjust the allow list whenever they want. You know, it doesn't require any infrastructure changes. They just make a, a little change to some site and it writes it to the database in the admin panel of the site. Now, that's uh, the current world or previous world without Kubernetes, but you know, I wanted to run this crown job now inside of Kubernetes instead of just where it was running before. So I transplanted the same curl command over. However, I like the idea of getting upgrades instead of side grades if I can. So for example, uh, when it comes to things like upgrades, you know, if you get something in return that's good and you're not like giving off any other bad things for that, like it's basically a straight upgrade that's good. But like a side grade is kind of like, well, you know, I get this one good thing, but uh, something else is a little bit worse. So it kind of feels like you're getting a side grade, right? Like something's getting upgraded, something's getting downgraded. Now, this Kubernetes cluster is on EKS. We're using AWS there. And there's a thing called the NAT gateway. This is not super important for the context of creating the whitelist at all, but just basic, basic, basic takeaway there is, uh, all external traffic coming from our Kubernetes cluster is going to be either one of two different public IP addresses, basically the IP address here of each NAT gateway. So, you know, if we had 15 nodes in our cluster that has hundreds of services and various workloads running, all of that outgoing traffic will be one of two IP addresses. And, um, you know, I go on to say here, like if we wanted to keep things exactly the same and curl the external domain like before, then our current solution of using the whitelist that we had up there with the exact match would be fine because all we would have to do there is add two IP addresses and we're good to go, right? But like I mentioned before, upgrades are really nice. And that feels more like a side grade, like eh, it's in Kubernetes, but it's like, mm, it's still like, it's still like hitting the external internet. So connecting to the public internet, um, it's not ideal, right? It's like traveling a hundred miles out of the way just to cross your street, you know? It's like, I just want to go like 15 feet across the street, but I have to like go around this mountain and over this bridge and, you know, through all this other stuff when really it's just like straight shot over. Yeah, so going over the public internet, right? It's a lot slower there since it involves the internet. It also needs to pass through uh, Route 53, which is uh, how AWS, like that's our managed service for DNS. There's also an AWS load balancer, the ALB there, application load balancer. You know, all of these, all of these things also have a direct, direct cost in money as well as time. Now, the amount of money for this API is not a lot. You know, we're not dealing with a massively, massively super uh, popular API there, but still, every single request that flows through Route 53 and the load balancer, everything like these things add up, 
So uh, also in the grand scheme of things, you know, this may take an extra 10 or 15 milliseconds to go through the internet and back. And uh, for an API that might get called a couple of times per minute, you know, that's not really a huge deal, but if we can avoid that, you know, why not? Let's keep it internal. So yeah, next header here is like sticking to the internal Kubernetes network. And I know I understand I'm getting into some Kubernetes stuff, but yeah, you know, we'll do future videos on that potentially. Now, uh, this is nice because Kubernetes actually provides us internal DNS by default. So you can just connect to a service, like for example, if you have two, versus, two services running on Kubernetes, you can literally just make a curl request to example, like just like that with no TLD, like there's no.com, you know, assuming your service at the Kubernetes level is named example. You know, if it's named Apple, then you literally just go to Apple there and it's going to work. And, uh, you know, in this case, it's over HTTP because the traffic never leaves your cluster. Uh, could be over HTTPS as well if your application supports that. It's really your call at that point. Uh, but the takeaway here is Route 53 and the ALB are not used. Public internet is not accessed as well. Now, for internal traffic though, within our cluster, we have a CIDR range of 10, 0, 0, 0, 16. So what that actually means is there's over 65,000 different possible IP addresses that uh, one of these pods can run, basically the container or the workload. So it could be anywhere from 10, 0, 0, 0 to 10, Dot zero dot fifty five dot two fifty five. Actually, there's a pretty good CIDR calculator calculator over here. I'll leave a link to this one in the description as well. So if I go and pop in sixteen here, then we can see the first IP is going to be ten. Oh, didn't mean to click that. Uh, ten dot zero dot zero dot zero, and the last IP there is ten zero two fifty five two two five. Now, if we also you know do something like twenty four there, then that is going to be um, yeah, a different range here where it's just going to be zero to 255 on the very end here at the last subnet. Um, we'll go over a little bit more around CIDR ranges once we get into code. But yeah, just understand that, you know, we're dealing with potentially 65,000 different IP addresses and needless to say, can't really add all of those to the a whitelist in a database. I mean, there's nothing wrong with adding 65,000 records, but really like adding all of them, it's not like a reasonable solution there. So we kind of have really two options here, right? We can choose to update the IP checking code to support CIDR blocks, or take a shortcut and instead maybe just do um, a different type of string comparison. So instead of doing an exact match, like, you know, A equal equals B, then we could do instead just like string starts with. So maybe we can have an IP address that starts with 10.0 because, you know, our internal IP addresses are going to uh, always start with 10.0. So that's like potentially two choices that we have here. So I hacked up a proof of concept here. And at this point, um, I haven't talked to anyone else about this feature. Also, just side note about this video, we are going to jump into a terminal and actually start running this code. Um, but, you know, we're not to the code part yet because it, it gets there in a bit. But anyways, yeah. So uh, I was basically in my own mind here, just uh, hacking things together. And at this position here, I'm pretty much like a solo SRE slash platform slash DevOps engineer, like whatever the heck you want to call this type of thing. I just work a lot with like Terraform and CI CD pipelines, helping developers, uh, Kubernetes, internet, blah, blah, blah. And um, I knew the crown job would fail using the internal network as it did. Um, yeah, and side topic, maybe I'll do more videos about this as well. Feel free to ask any questions in the comments below. I'll do my best about answering like, you know, like what do I do or, you know, anything that comes up like that. But Going back to here, yes, I knew the crown job would fail in, in the current state because, you know, if, if this uh, crown job is just going to be spun up in a pod that runs a curl command, you know, that pod's going to have maybe, let's say, an IP address of 10.0.8.17. It could be, you know, any of these two numbers here is going to be different. And since it wasn't white whitelisted, not going to work. Um, but, you know, I went on to say here, you know, we're dealing with hacking up a proof of concept here. The option of using starts with felt a little hacky, but the IPLL list was isolated to one function in the code. So here's like a simplified version of the code here, just a little bit of Python code. Um, yeah, it's basically just saying, you know, if the IP address, and this is like the request IP address, is in this allowed IPs that we just split on the comma here, you know, this is really just basically making a database query. Just imagine that this query returned like a, a list of, of IP addresses that were separated with comma. You know, so basically, yeah, if the IP address is in one of the results here, then Yes, okay, cool, we're good, let's allow the IP address, else if it doesn't match, then not allowed, sorry, can't get through. And this is, you know, where we were hitting here, trying to go for this IP address here because it wasn't in the allow list. So I figured I can modify that condition to check an IP pre prefix, you know, something like this, basically. You know, if the IP address starts with 10.0 or the IP address is in the allowed list, then we just return true here. And uh, yeah, that would actually happen before the database was touched for this first condition here, because Python, in case you didn't know, it does support short circuiting on certain conditions here. Basically, if this evaluates to true, like let's say it is coming from the internal network, then this or condition, it doesn't even need to execute. So no database is going to be hit at all. It's just going to be like, okay, cool. Yeah, the IP address starts with 10.0, we're done, and we can just return. And all this code here doesn't even need to execute here. 
And um, yeah, I mentioned here that it feels a little bit hacky because there's like a floating number in the middle of a function here. You know, I know we have also no real use case for needing a proper uh, CIDR check here, but still, it just feels a little bit dirty, right, to consider actually shipping like this to production as it is there. But there were other aspects that I really liked a lot, like not needing to do the database lookup there. Then I just asked one of our developers for an opinion because, you know, there is a decent sized dev team, 15, 16 developers that uh, I talk to on a regular basis. But, you know, my position technically is a solo position. But yeah, I'm just in direct contact with these devs all the time. Uh, they do quite a few code reviews on my stuff, even if it's non-coding related. Whereas I also do some reviews on their stuff, like when it makes sense. Now, he read the ticket that I created, which explained the whole problem, um, you know, a little bit less detailed than the blog post. And even went over some comparisons like pros and cons, which we're going to get here in, in the post as well. And uh, yeah, they said based basically one thing that was really super interesting. So they, after reading that, said, hey, by the way, will that 10.0 address ever change? And this, to me, was a very, very interesting question. And it was one of those crazy things where, like, it just flipped something in my brain. And within one second, like, the final solution appeared and, like, an entire, like, universe, like, unraveled within itself. So, you know, my proof of concept there, it had some, uh, or rung some internal warning bells, and it felt kind of hacky. That's because the app implementation was brittle, right? It had floating numbers in the middle of a function. It didn't really make it too easy to test with different IP for prefixes, right? So you could say that the implementation was hacky, but the idea of using starts with for our use case wasn't. Um, so anyways, yeah, like the 10.0 is never going to change unless like we specifically rebuilt our VPC and cluster and decided to use something else other than 10.0. But uh, yeah, there's no way the developer and the team would know that because it's like, a, you know, infrastructure really the thing, like they're not just dealing with that stuff on a day to day. But in my mind, like in my head, you know, I initially felt comfortable hard coding that because like I just knew like that, yeah, that's basically not going to change. But uh, yeah, going back to that one second universe there, like this really did shift my entire like mental model of the problem by thinking like, well, what if it did need to change? And that at least made me think that this value should be a config option, right? It shouldn't just be like a hard coded string somewhere in a function. But uh, it didn't stop there though, because then I thought to myself a little bit here, like, well, what if we wanted to support more than one IP range, which uh, also seems like very reasonable. So then the solution there, right, became a lot more clear. So what I really want here is like an IP whitelist exemption list. So it's like, it's now a thing, you know, it's an exemption, exemption list for something else. So basically a list of IP addresses or ranges that will always be uh, allowed access. Once that became a concept, then it really made sense. Like, yeah, avoiding the DB lookup there since, ex since it's exempt is like a really good idea. And uh, the details of using either, you know, string starts with or the CIDR block, you know, that's kind of a second secondary decision. And uh, yeah, now it's time to make that decision, right? What do we do? Do we do like starts with 10.x or do we add insider support? So in nearly a decade of this application running, there was never a single customer request to support uh, a CIDR block or range of IP addresses to the whitelist. It was always just like one-off, like, okay, cool, we just add that one IP. So it didn't feel like it was worth adding uh, CIDR block support, like just for the heck of it. And also, you know, I mentioned before, like this API, it's not super high traffic. So execution speed of this function, it's not critically, critically important, right? I always like to have free performance if I can take it here. But I did have a hunch here that the CIDR validation function is going to take longer to run. But I didn't that didn't really let that play a big role in the decision. And now we're going to get into benchmarks later, but like it turned out, uh, doing a CIDR validation here and, you know, checking to see if an IP address is in a CIDR range or black whatever is uh, 50 times slower than doing the starts with built-in approach, at least with Python, where the string starts with approach. Uh, yeah, but it's kind of like one of those weird deceptive benchmarks, right? Like you would think like, Jesus, man, 50 times slower, that's that's trash. Like I'm never gonna use that unless like I really, really had to. But, you know, it really came down to taking like 15 microseconds to do the CIDR block calculation versus 0.3 microseconds for doing the, the string starts with. Now, what does that really mean in like the grand scheme of things? Cause it's really hard to judge like 0.3 microseconds, you know, which is a huge difference between like a millisecond, but we're talking like fractions of a microsecond now. So what that really means is the CIDR block calculation could happen about 67,000 times in one second. And doing the string starts with is about three and a half million executions per second. So, you know, that seems like a massive difference, right? And it would be very concerning. But uh, the thing is though, if your entire web response takes 30 milliseconds to fulfill a, a response, which is, you know, uh, what is that? A thousand times more than a microsecond, like one microsecond, a 14.5 microsecond difference is really basically nothing here. I, I feel like that's a typo that should be, yeah, difference instead of different, whatever. It'll be fixed when the blog post is up. But, um, you know, I did end up going with the starts with solution because it kind of met our business requirements there. You know, it being faster was kind of just a bonus here. 
Um, but things are now coded in such a way where like switching that implementation from either using starts with or the cider block, not a big deal at all. It's basically just a tiny bit of logic tucked away in one function that uh, if I wanted to change that, all I do is change it there. Like the calling code doesn't make uh, a difference at all. So, you know, I feel like it's a, a reasonable solution there. So now let's go a little bit over the code and the benchmarks. So before we jump into the code, yeah, all three cases here, I just want to let you know that the way the code is written out here, it's sort of similar to how it is in the terminal. But um, yeah, I think it's going to be a little bit easier just to get into the code now, like without reading some stuff here. Uh, so let me go and we will take a look here at some of the code. Now, I've got like this one Python file here. And by the way, I should have mentioned this at the start of the video. Sorry about that. All three solutions are using Python standard library. We're not going to be using any third party dependencies. And this script here is kind of just like running the benchmarks and running the actual functions that are all in different files here. But if I go here and we run Python three, what are we running here? Allow IP address. And then let's just say 10.1. I don't know, 3.42. Like this should return false for all three of them because you know the whitelist is only 10.0. So we get false, false, false here. And we can see also we have our different benchmarks that are running. Um, yeah, it's gonna be interesting going over the, the biggest differences here. And like, holy cow, cow, that thing takes like uh, nine executions per second, but that one's like 2.4 million, crazy. But uh, yeah, this one file just basically kicks off running all the stuff. But let's get into the actual implementation of each one. and. Let's just start with uh, the one that I used, right? This starts with one. And uh, yeah, we can see here there's two different functions. And before we get into the functions, just a couple, couple variables to find up here. So this would be your exempt list, right? The config option. Now I have things in completely isolated Python files here, but of course, you know, if you're using Flask, then this would be a config option. Or if you're using Fast API or Django or whatever, you know, they're not just gonna be floating in a file somewhere that's like in your application. And I also wanted to create basically a fake database, right? I'm not using like Postgres or MySQL or SQL Alchemy or anything like that. So just imagine like your database returns back a list of allowed IP addresses that you have in your database level. And we have this one function here, and this function is actually the same uh, for all three of these different implementations here. And all of this one does here, it goes over that code that we went over in the blog post where, you know, if, uh, if always allow IP address, this is a new function by the way, but you know, this IP address by the way is the, uh, request coming in. If that is true, then we're done. Like we return true, it's the exempt list. Or, you know, if the IP address is in the fake DB allowed IPs, then we also know we're good to go and we can, we can return true there because it's in the actual allowed list. Otherwise return false that the user is denied. So that's the same for all three of these files that we're going to go over here. But uh, the implementation of the always allow IP address, uh, I decided to word it like this. This is the exempt function, if you're exempt or not. Um, yeah, it's, it's different for each one. Now, it's the same in the sense that it returns true or false and you know and accepts an IP address as input, but this is the logic that is uh, different between all three. And this one's kind of interesting, and this was new to me before I started this adventure of figuring out um, how to do this with starts with. Did you know that starts with not only works for strings, but also works with a tuple of strings? Basically, this bypasses us needing to do a for in on this exempt IPs list. So this IP address here, that is the IP address that we just did a look at here before. I already forgot it, but it was some like 10.0.8. whatever, right? Right. That's a string over here. But we can basically say, you know, does that IP address start with what? A tuple of exempt IPs. So we can't pass in the list directly. We need to uh, transform it here or cast it into a tuple here. But there's a list up, up here. And yeah, it's just going to work out of the box. And then it is going to return true here if the IP does. So let's just uh, rerun this command here. And it takes a little bit for the last one, but uh, going back here, yeah, there's a 10, 1, 3, 42 there. And yeah, this is basically going to go through every single item here in this exempt IPs list. And it's going to do starts with uh, on that. And if any one of those happens to be true, then we're out of here and we're good to go. And uh, if none of them happen to work, then it's going to return false. So, you know, if I put in, um, well, actually we just saw the, the false, right? But here's like the true one. So if I do that, then uh, yeah, they're all true there. Now, this is the output for all three implementations, not just the one. But uh, yeah, that's basically how this one works, right? Pretty straightforward, basically one line of code. You know, if the IP starts with uh, one of these items in the list here, then we're good to go and we're out. Now, let's go into the next solution here. Actually, before we go to the next one, let's just go over some pros and cons of, you know, when you might not want to use a solution. So, you know, this one works when we just add a prefix, basically, you know, it starts with 10.0, or if you wanted to do 10.1 or something like 10.0.2 or something, you can do that type of thing. But this is not a proper CIDR range block support, right? 
And uh, if you really need that, then this solution is not going to work for you. So then you might want to look into sorry to black support here, which would, uh, this would be the second one here. I, I named it net and then we do net list. It doesn't really matter what these names are. I kind of just name them whatever the heck they are. Now there's a lot of duplicate code here because I just wanted to isolate each file to be standalone where they just have, uh, yeah, like this function here is no different at all. And uh, we have the very similar exempt IPs list here. Notice now it's not 10.0, it's actually 10.0.0.0 slash 16. This is uh, the side of range that we went over before, which is going to allow us to, yeah, match on the IP that we want here, at least in the context of the Kubernetes cluster, you know, 10.0. Whatever, it's going to be good to go. And then also, yeah, we have our fake IPs here. I don't think I demoed that yet, which definitely didn't, but you know, if we do one, two, three, four, then that is going to work as well. Uh, in this case, it's not on the exempt list, but it is in the database. So in this case, you know, this is going to evaluate the false, or then this one will be true and, you know, false or true, it's going to be true because uh, it's not an and. An and both needs to be true, just in case you didn't know. Uh, but yeah, that's basically how that works. But the implementation details are different than what we just saw for the other one. The other one, I was, you know, we had that one liner to do starts with, but now we're actually using two built-in functions from Python. So this is all built into the standard library. You can just uh, import these two functions from the IP address. And by the way, it was kind of funny, you know, dealing with uh, naming these variables here because you've got things like the module name from Python is called IP address. You've got a function called IP underscore address in that module. And then you want things like your own IP address variable here because you're, you know, looping over exempt IPs or something like that. Um, so lots of like, is it IP or IP address or IP address like this? Like, yeah, I got to admit that's a little confusing, but uh, yeah, that's kind of just the world that we're in here. You know, we could have alternatively imported this in a different way where we just do uh, like import IP address and then you can do like IP address dot IP underscore address that looked a little bit weirder, weirder. So I, I figured this was a little bit more uh, readable for me. I, I kind of prefer that style, especially if I'm just importing a couple of different functions here. It's not too bad, but uh, yeah, depends on what it is because some of them will just like pollute your global namespace. So yeah, like for example, like uh, IP address is just called now directly. You kind of don't know if that's coming from a Python module or not. Uh, but in this case, I went for this solution. Uh, it doesn't really matter, right? Pick, pick whatever one that you want. But in this case here, we need to now loop over all the exempt IPs. And for each IP in that list, we are going to basically just do another very simple condition here to be like, okay, is the IP address coming in uh, in our actual CIDR range? In this case, by the way, I should also mention like these, both of these functions here, here it supports using either a CIDR block or uh, a direct IP address. So if I go here and we do something like 127, that zero dot one. Can we still read this? Yes, we can. There we go. So, and you can actually see the other one runs a lot faster now too. But uh, that's a we'll get there when you get there. But yeah, this works here with uh, a direct IP address. So that's kind of nice that it just works the same for both. But yeah, these are both built-in functions in Python's documentation. Kind of don't want to spend a huge amount of time there, but yeah, this basically allows you to check if an IP address is in a side or black range here. So yeah, it just does a comparison there. You know, what's really cool though about this is like it looks very normal, like, like a string, like you're just doing like, you know, if string in other string, but we're not dealing with strings. We're dealing with, um, yeah, special, whatever these happens to be. I forget what they are like either IPv4 or IPv6 addresses. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure it's smart enough to determine which one is which based on how the IP address starts. But yeah, that's, that's very nice that it's just like, it feels usable, even though you're not dealing with uh, a string, it feels very comparable to using one. But again, like, you know, code complexity wise, this isn't really too bad, right? Whatever. It's like one extra line of code, but, um, that's not a big deal here, uh, but it does run a little bit slower and by a little bit, it's actually 50 times slower, but does it really matter? Mm, I don't think it really matters that uh, much in this case, right? And we can see in the benchmark results here that, uh, the first one, the allow IP address, what starts with, right? Roughly 3 million executions per second. It's this many seconds here, which is, uh, you know, about a third of a microsecond and we can see here the function that we just looked at here. This one runs, you know, roughly 58,000 times, you know, this number is going to change uh, a little bit different depending on how many times I run it, right? Yeah, there we go. We can see 58,000, whatever. When I'm not recording a video with OBS, the numbers are a little bit higher, but you can see though, basically, right, it was like 15 microseconds in the blog post. So we're just dealing with a very small difference here uh, in the grand scheme of things, even though these numbers look wildly different. Um, that's the solution here. Now, again, which one do you use? Well, it's up to you. Like if you need proper side or block support, uh, I would roll with the solution. Wouldn't bother looking at any other solutions there, unless you were gonna like hand roll your own solution, but I don't think it's gonna be faster than that most likely. Uh, 
But yeah, feel free to prove me wrong on that one in a good way. Like if you want to write a faster implementation than what's in the Python standard library, that's amazing. Uh, if you do that, you might as well contribute it back to the Python standard library, and now you would be uh, a core contributor to the language, and that would be awesome. Um, but now let's look at the third solution here, which is netlist. And this one, for this specific use case, there's no way I would do it. You can see here, it takes literally 100 milliseconds or 110 milliseconds just to execute once. So like you can only do this like 10 times per second. Even before I wrote all this benchmarking code here, like just running this one in a terminal by itself, it just, oh man, you can feel the delay. And um, for good reason though, because this one is like, way more complex in terms of like the work that needs to happen. So this is all the same, right? Exempt IP is still, deal still dealing with uh, side of black ranges here. They're fine. Uh, IPs are the same. This function is the same. This is the different part. So interestingly enough, I, I call this one exempt IP instead of IP. Well, that because I had the other comprehension IP there named that. Okay, cool. And this one I actually found on Stack Overflow. And it's kind of interesting. I almost just included this one only because when I was Googling around for like, you know, how to find if an IP address is in a CIDR block or, you know, within a specific IP range, then one solution kept coming up again and again in like three different searches. And it all said like, you just do this and then like you do that and then like you got it. And it's like, cool, like it works. But, you know, there were some comments around saying it was really slow. And the reason this is really slow uh, is... This over here is going to return back an actual Python list of every single IP address that's available in that CIDR block. So in this case, you know, we went over how many were there, right? Like 65,000 different IP addresses. So if you actually, like this evaluates to 65,000 different IP addresses. Yeah, I mean, it's not even like, or, and then you just exit if you found a match. No, because, you know, it's actually going through all of them and then putting them into this variable here. And then you're doing like, you know, if IP address and all IP. So like, no matter what, you're looping through all of them. Uh, that's not a good time complexity there, uh, especially if that CIDR block was even wider. So instead of like 65,000, I, I don't even know what the other one would have been actually. So let me just go here. Actually, let's side topic really fast here and just go back to, <laughs> I know, sorry for jumping around, but uh, I wrote a little bit of things after the different codes here. Yeah, right. So let's say pretty much blah, blah, blah. Uh, the reason I like this code, again, just going back to the starts with one, right? It almost reads exactly how it is out loud. It's like, if the IP address starts with any one of the exempt IPs, then we found a match and we can exit and then we're good. Right, and then I go on to say like there's no CIDR support there, which is, uh, you know, why the exempt IPs has 10.0 instead of having uh, the black there. But uh, yeah, that's basically that. Then the second one that we looked at here, yeah, this is the whole reason why I wanted to jump back here. So this one, <clears throat> yeah, it says uh, blah, 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 everything's about the same. By the way, if you just want a quick reference of different uh, CIDR block ranges here, we can see that if you do something like 10.0.0, that zero slash 32, that's going to match the exact single one IP address of this. Uh, slash 24 is going to do basically 10.0.0x. You can only have 255 of them. Uh, this one is 65,000 of them because there's two different subnets there. And the third one, like 10.2.8.17 would work. I don't know how many thousands or hundreds of thousands that's going to be, or potentially millions. I think, what is it? Is it just 256 because it's zero base times 256 times 256? I don't know. Uh, where's that calculator that I was looking at before? Let's see if I can find this one. Uh, calc calculator. There we go. I just want to see like for my own sanity here, if I go back down to what this was, yeah. What is slash eight? How many IP addresses is that? It's going to be a one hell of a lot. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Uh, that's a lot. So we can see that. Well, actually, does it even say how many total host? Yeah. 16 million, right? So I don't even want to run it, but if our, if our block was slash eight there and this ran, I mean, Actually, let's just see for fun how long that's going to take to run. Because you're probably thinking, how long would it take to run? Uh, I'm actually going to change this to just run once because I, you know, I have a feeling it's going to take. I don't know how long it's going to take. It's going to take, I think, minutes. Because you got to think, if it takes 100 milliseconds to go through 65,000 of them, and now we need to go through 16 million of them, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be stopping this before we even finish. Like that's how long it's going to take. <laughs> but let's go back to the blog post here. Yeah, so maybe I should include how many numbers of uh, IPs this matches here. That could be useful because that's the information I really wanted to get at. But yeah, just going back to here before, like this network IP function, I linked to it in the docs there for Python. So feel free to read that on your own. Um, and I also went to a Python interpreter off video whenever this post first, just to go over some examples of just how it works here. So if you just pass in a straight up IP address to the IP address from here, like, you know, I, this time I just, I was in the, in the interpreter, so I just imported IP address. That's why um, I'm calling with that. But then we can see here, like, yes, this IP address is in that CIDR block range. Great, cool, it's true. 
But if you do 10.0.842, to you know, that's not going to be in 10.0.02 because it's just a straight up IP address, false. However, you can do a direct match here if they line up here, which is true. So this is nice. Like if you need to use this, it's, it's a very versatile solution. And then, yeah, going back to uh, the third solution that we're just looking at here, did this finish yet? Probably not. Oh, it did. Okay. Um, my calculation, you know, it was kind of hard coded to not expect something to take that long, but we can see however long this is into actual seconds. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it took a lot. Um, what is that, like 229 seconds or, or is that 294 seconds? All right, can you make me Google this? All right, I will. Let's just see what this is. What are we doing? We are doing microseconds to seconds calculator. And then we're gonna do how many microseconds? That many. Okay, so it's actually 30 seconds, give or take, to run once. That's actually not as bad as I thought, but I mean, imagine running that on every single API, API request, right? It's just not feasible. Um, let's go back to Netlist here, bring this back to 16. And then, yeah, so, you know, implementation wise, we just have a massive, massive list of IP addresses, and then we're just checking to see if they're in there. So clearly not a good idea for this specific use case. But, you know, I go on to say here that, uh, well, a couple of things, right? This solution is a little bit brittle because it only supports IPv4. You know, if you have a client coming in with IPv6, then the whole entire thing is not going to work because that, o that is only going to work in IPv4. Whereas uh, the first solution with the starts with, that is going to work with either one because it doesn't matter. Uh, what protocol it is, right? It's just going to work based on string matching. And I think the second one may work uh, with IP and v v4 or v6. Yeah, we can see here, I know it's a little small, sorry. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so in both cases, it returns either an IPv4 or IPv6 address here. Uh, internally at the function level, it figures out which one it is based on what happens to be, and we can see some examples here. So this is great, right? It's gonna work for, for both, which is quite nice. But going back to here, yeah, a little bit brittle just to have that hard coded. We know it's like really slow here too as well. But again, I kind of just in, uh, included this one here because Stack Overflow kept returning this one near the top uh, around a very gen general problem of like, how do I find if, the, if this IP is within a range? But I have gone to say too, like, it's really cool that this function does exist. Like if you just wanted to get a list once somewhere else, like, you know, for a list of all the IPs in a specific uh, CIDR block, that's cool. Like, you know, maybe that's not something you run in every request, but like you need that information, now you got it. You can just run that and you're good. So yeah, uh, let's go over a little bit here around some benchmark results, a little bit easier to read, I think on this page here potentially. Um, but, you know, I include some specs around my machine here, but the relative difference, right, is the thing that's most important here. I have like a seven-year-old workstation uh, that's running an i5, 3.2 gigahertz CPU, 16 gigs of memory, SSD, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm inside of WSL2 running Python 3.810 because that's what's installed, I think, by default with 20.04 or Ubuntu 20.04. I haven't updated to 22 yet. But we can see here, uh, I'll zoom in a little bit more for the code samples, that, where are we at here? Over here. Then, yeah, I mean, depending on... Uh, the relative numbers are a little bit different, but you can see they're a tiny bit higher here. 67,000, 3.5 million, let's call it. And this one's like, you know, every 100 milliseconds, forget it. Um, but if you do want to run these things locally, uh, I do have this file that we looked at before, the one that kicks off running all the benchmarking and stuff. That's all here. You can copy paste all these files here. Uh, you know, going back to this code here, you can just, uh, yeah, just put this in your editor and save it and you're done. Like I actually, it looks like I forgot to put netlist pi as a comment there. Just for explicit sake, I will put that in before uh, this video goes out there. But yeah, if you just want to go very quickly over the benchmarking file itself, it's not really important, it's not really related to IP addresses at all. But yeah, all I did here, right, is we have these three different files that we went over. They are all just regular Python modules and I just import them with a different name depending on which one it is because they all have that allow IP address function but with Python, you can do as, and then you can pick a custom name. So that allows us to, you know, distinguish which one is which based on just giving it a custom name of our choosing. Doesn't need to match, like this doesn't need to match that. It could be whatever you want. And then all I do here, I just grab uh, the first or technically second argument, you know, just basically the parameter, the IP address that we're typing over here. And that just becomes the IP that we pass into the functions that we're importing here, and those functions all take just an IP address, and there we go. Um, you know, in a real world web application, this IP address wouldn't come from the command line, it's gonna come from whatever web framework you happen to be using, right? You can just read that from the request there, and you got it. And then the benchmark function itself, um, I just call it three different times for each function that we imported. I did a thousand here because if I go lower, then you start getting the scientific notation stuff. I just wanted to get a regular number, and uh, this one is 10 instead of a thousand because it takes forever. And also this benchmarking code is kind of, 
you know, not super best practice stuff. I just threw this together because I just wanted to have a very quick benchmark of just seeing the time execution for, the for these things. The Python does have a built-in uh, module called timeit, where you can basically say, hey, by the way, like I want to run this one function, um, read things in from the global environment instead of local, like local would be things scoped to this function, global I think is anywhere, whatever. How many times do you want to run it? A thousand times, that's uh, an argument here. And we can see function is, is the function ar argument there. And that's the uh, variable being passed into the function here. When we call it, we can see that we are calling it here. There's the function. There is the value being passed in, same syntax there. And then all I do there is uh, I just convert because this number is going to come back as a float, I'm pretty sure. So I just convert it to a string that's like 20 decimals so we don't get any crazy scientific notation or any issues like that. And then, yeah, I just convert that time down into microseconds, which is just, yeah, taking a float of uh, the time there, multiply it by a million, and then I just wanted to round that to two decimals. And then the executions per second, really. Yeah, this was just interesting. So it's kind of funny being a programmer, like math is not my strongest suit at all. But did you know that if you actually divide one into some number that looks like this, then you actually get the executions per second there. So that was pretty cool. I actually didn't even know that beforehand. Um, but yeah, I know I'm kind of skimming over this in, in that great detail, but whatever, it's just like sort of basic math, I guess. And we're just, you know, also using F string property of Python there along with the colon to be like, hey, by the way, like I want these numbers formatted with a comma, like how we would expect to to see um, a normal number there, right? Like this is 1.7 million, that's 52,000. We can see the comma is in the correct place. So those are cool little like Python tricks, I guess, to quickly format strings in ways that you want. And then, you know, we just output the function name, which is what we see over here. And then time per second is uh, time per second. And then also the time in microseconds as well. And then we also have the execution time, which is, uh, yeah, this calculation over here, which is just some number there. So that is going to be it for this video, I think. Ended up being pretty long. Uh, one of my longer videos in a while. But yeah, it's kind of fun. You know, real world use case of just implementing an IP allow list that has an optional exempt list. And that's basically where we're at with this video here. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. Also, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up because it really does help a lot. Thanks a lot for watching and I will see you in the next video.